Great. Well, welcome everybody to the Prostate Cancer Lab. Uh, we're excited to have this session today. Um, today, we have a special guest. He's one of our uh, illustrious members of our com community, Jeff Dwyer. Um, Jeff is uh, facing a decision in his treatment, and um, he really needs some help uh, to, to navigate this. And I think that um, what we don't talk about often in our sessions are the comorbidities that patients face. And uh, he does have a unique situation where he's trying to navigate not only his prostate cancer, but also uh, challenges with um, his heart as well as bone disease. And so uh, Jeff is going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, his his uh, uh, his cancer journey and uh, tee us up for hopefully a, a really productive and helpful conversation um, that can uh, help guide his next treatment decisions. And really, this is what the Prostate Cancer Lab is all about. It's helping us as patients make those really important, complex decisions um, as we go through this journey. And so just as a reminder, you know, the information and opinions expressed in this website and the platform uh, during discussions and presentations, both verbal and written, are not intended as healthcare recommendations or medical advice by the Prostate Cancer Lab, its principals, presenters, participants, or representatives for any medical treatment, product, or course of action. Always consult your doctor about your specific situation uh, before pursuing any healthcare program treatment um, or product. And so that was the official legalese, uh, Brad, uh, that was actually the official statement. Brad uh, does a nice job uh, uh, just narrating that. Anyway, so um, thank you all again for joining. And Jeff, uh, really looking forward to- The other disclaimer, to... Brian, is the uh, the fact that everything you can say can and will be used against you in a court of law. That is- <laughs> uh, Yes, thank you. I have to update my standard language. I'm, I think I'm using some old copy here. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, thank you guys. And Jeff, I think um, you should be able to take control um, and present uh, your story. So uh, just to just to make that point, so anybody who is not, uh, who is interested in remaining anonymous, uh, please, you know, hide your name, disguise your name, turn off your camera, whatever it might be because everything will be made public that uh, is said here today. So I should not say, can you hear me okay, Brad? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you fine. Okay, I should probably not say anything nasty about any of my past doctors. Okay. Right. Okay, for you that haven't read what I've said in emails, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer in May of 2019 um, down in Florida. I returned to Massachusetts, got a biopsy in August of 2019, met with the group of docs at Mass General, um, urologist, uh, radiologist, medical oncologist. By then I'd read a couple of uh, books about prostate cancer and talked with a group of friends of mine who had it um, and it had been dealing with it for several years and decided when I got the Gleason 910 um, designation, I decided to have the prostatectomy. So I had it done at Mass General. It went well, about four hour operation. I got my continents back in about three or four months. And uh, then I, I waited and watched. Uh, my PSA went to undetectable. Then it, went, it slowly started to rise. Uh, and in, oh, uh, Let's see, May of, 20, May of 2022, it reached 0.21. By then I had left Mass General and moved over to Dana-Farber. I selected uh, Alicia Morgans as a medical oncologist. I'd never selected an oncologist over at Mass General. I just never liked them. So, uh, and I decided I wanted a young female 
oncologist because I thought they would be more sym sympathetic and not play the tough guy role with some of the medic, the oncologist I had talked to. So uh, I wrote her a letter, asked her for a consultation. She agreed. We got along and she did genetics. She did um, uh, PMSA PET scan. I should probably back up and say I was following the PSMA PET scans and I was on the ANCAN site and saw that the uh, guy that runs the ANCAN site uh, for veterans is Joe Gallo. And he mentioned in passing that uh, the VA in LA was doing a random cl clinical trial, small one, 400 guys for vets, um, if in the middle of the summer of uh, 2021. So I called up the doctor that was administrating that, told him my, my PSA was low. It wasn't point, it hadn't reached point two yet. And he encouraged me to come out. He said, I've got three or four more spots left registered for the VA. I wasn't registered at the time. Um, he accepted me in. I flew out on a uh, red eye, stayed a couple nights, got the PSMA PET. And um, the only uptake was some, uh, some probably the, the dye was in my urine because it was in my urethra, but there was nothing else visible at that time. So I came back to Mass. Um, and then was, that was the, uh, let's see, that would be the, the summer of 20, uh, 21, and I got told by my cardiologist that I'd been seeing at Mass General Brigham and Women since uh, 2015 that I had to have open heart surgery. So I had that the end of July 2021, quintuple bypass surgery. That kicked the shit out of me. That was a tough one. And, uh, and then I'm in the middle of pandemic. So I could not have uh, a real active cardiac rehab plan afterwards because you had the home visiting nurses coming in and they'd go to a half a dozen places every day and I didn't want them in my place. So I didn't do it. I basically did whatever I did on my own, bought a treadmill. And so my recovery of strength and what have you was really slow. And I'm still recovering from that. But uh, improving. So when, anyway, fast forward when Dr. Morgan said that, uh, look, it looks like you've reached biochemical recurrence, you should get um, radiation. I'd been investigating proton beam because uh, I'd read the books on it and I wanted to do that. I, talk, I had a telemed conference with Dr. Rossi, telemed conference with Randall Cunningham down in University of Florida. But I couldn't get any traction in Boston at the Mass General. They do not use their proton beam um, machine that's over in Cambridge for prostate cancer treatment. They just don't use it. I kept pushing and asking them and finally got the radio oncologist over there, uh, radiation oncologist to tell me that it was a business decision at Mass General. They did not use proton beam because um, a total business decision. And he said it kind of apologetically. And then I knew I was leaving. That was the last I was going to see them. So I went over to Dana-Farber. So when Dr. Morgans um, said I needed radiation, I expected pushback. You know, they're across the street from uh, Brigham and Women from uh, her when I told her I wanted a proton beam and I had targeted um, the Roberts Center at uh, Philadelphia. I didn't get that. She said, I know Dr. Vapawala there. Um, I said, that's the, the woman I'd like to see. And I'd already made a cold call. I was waiting for a call back from them. So Dr. Morgan's called, set up the schedule. And I went down there and stayed for two months and got the 30, 34 proton beam um, radiation of my spine, my prostate bit, and a met that had shown up on my sacrum, small one, three millimeter one. Um, I had no problems other than fatigue, but lower back pain that I 
that I mentioned about Bawala. She did a uh, MRI and said, you know, we usually get some inflammation if there's Mets. So maybe that pain is from inflammation. But when she did the MRI, she said, you've got a series of um, compression fractures um, on your spine and you ought to look into that. So uh, the pain didn't go away, it got worse. So you know, I'm kind of panicking thinking, so they did an MRI, to, but it's not a PSMA PET. So if I got cancer in my spine, what is it? So when I got back to Mass, uh, I went to the Mass General Spinal Center in, uh, in Boston and had CT scan, MRI, saw a, a surgeon there that specialized in failed back surgeries. I figured he would be the best guy to see. And he analyzed my spine and said, you have five compression fractures, four of them have healed, which to me recalls all of those appointments I'd had with chiropractors over the years as they were breaking. And I thought, and I should have gone to an orthopedic center, but I didn't. I was right at the University of Florida. I didn't. I used local chiropractors. So, the, so my theory and the surgeon in Boston was that those as those continued to, to pancake, my vertebrae continued to pancake down from the first one to the second to the third one, as my bone density got weaker from the in osteoporosis that I didn't know I had. Um, each time I thought I had lower back problems, they healed. So the one I'm dealing with now is the last one at the bottom, right at the, uh, at the bottom of my spine that is giving me the pain, but none of them pinch nerves. They basically, uh, my spinal cord is fine. And the doctor said, you know, we don't do any of the spinal surgeries that we used to do. We don't operate anymore at uh, Brigham and Women um, and put in any of the patented medicines or whatever, you know, injections of plastic cements or whatever. He says, we find that when we do that, we immobilize one section of the spine and something not above or below breaks. So it's a change policy. So he said, so as far as you're concerned, go, go home, start exercising, start doing um, yoga and PT. So I started PT, started yoga for osteoporosis. And uh, it's basically, sometimes you're laying there doing the yoga and you're not saying you're doing anything. You're trying to isolate those, those muscles on, along your back and in your core. But I'm feeling progress and I'm doing weight training both um, I'm following Doug McGuff's uh, super slow, you know, over at the senior center. And that's working out well. I'm feeling better. So I walk over there. So I can, I can now walk for about an hour a day without any pain. Um, that's unbearable. And I feel that uh, I've got to deal with the osteoporosis first. Um, now, talking with Alan Morris by email um, recently, I guess I'm in a zone called metastasis, metastasis directed radiation. And uh, from what Alan explained to me, he said, you haven't reached your biochemical level a second time. And he studied my um, PSA. My PSA nadir now is 0.14. And it's been that way for six months. And now it's starting to rise again. It's up to 0.21. But as far as from what Alan explained to me, he said, when you reach it again, it will be 0.28, not 0.21. And he explained to me that the, and maybe all you guys know this, but I didn't, that the rate, the proton beam or proton beams that occur during radiation of the spine and the prostate bed, they keep killing the cancer when it when it gets ready to divide again for anywhere from six to 18 months. So um, at this point, it's probably still killing the cancer 
because I haven't been a year from that treatment. My treatment ended the first week in October of 2022. So I haven't been a year since that stopped. So at this point, Dr. Morgans and I had a telemed meeting. I'm going to start getting monthly PSAs and we're gonna revisit a PSMA PET scan probably the end of October or um, end of September or October, because what Dr. Morgan has told me, Medicare will pay um, for uh, PSMA PET um, at Dana-Farber annually uh, for somebody that's got the, the profile of prostate cancer that I have. Um, so that's where I am now. If Dr. Morgans wants me to go on, um, I've really shied away of no hormones at all because I was concerned with the effects of, on cardiac. So uh, with my heart stuff, so I stayed away from it. And uh, if I was going to use it, I've been leaning towards possibly using um, transdermal estrogen, estradiol, because it supports bone health. And if I, if I got out of, if the cancer gets out of control, then I would move from that into that. And so that's why I've been investigating that. So that's kind of my kitchen table, seat of the pants plan at this point right now. Okay. Yeah, there, there you go. That's my, uh, that's my homemade prostate cancer spread, uh, PSA spread, spreadsheet. Okay, so, so, uh, so Jeff, there's a lot going on with your history. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could help to guide the audience just a little bit in terms of, you know, what are the, what are the key decisions that you have to make? And um, and what do you, in priority order, like what, what you know, what, what, are, what do you need help with the most right now? And we'll, we'll kind of like knock them off. Um, well, I think I'm, I, my next decision will be picking one of the three or four um, bone mineral density meds. I've been encouraged by Paul uh, by, um, Van Camp and by Richard Wasserstock to select one and to start it soon because my biggest, I've been, I've been told right now, your biggest problem since you're, my heart is stable and I see my cardiac doctor next month in August and, uh, and I've been seeing him since 2015. But my big problem now is the osteoporosis because the DEXA scan, parenthetically, I mentioned this to some of you fellows, but I think that, that one of the tests that they should start you when you start prostate cancer treatment is you should get a DEXA scan as part of your bone scan. Because had I known that I had osteoporosis, um, which was not in my family hereditary, um, I would have started something to treat it long before. If I had started the um, hormone therapy, I could have really complicated myself with the, with the um, bone mineral density. So I'm fortunate that I haven't done that. I agree with that. Hey, Jeff, I, I, I hear like a clicking noise. It almost sounds like a pen clicking. Um, yeah, it's a little, it's, it's a little, it's a little distracting. Um, <laughs> okay. So, um, um, so I, the, the good news is that I think that we've got a couple of people that hopefully might be able to help you uh, with respect to understanding pros and cons of some of the uh, bone density or bone strengthening drugs. Um, I, I hate to put them on the spot, but I'm, I'm going to do that. They can defer if they don't, if they don't want to answer. But uh, Robert uh, Germankin, who's uh, a dentist, and of course, uh, uh, we have uh, Rick on the line as well, Rick Stanton on the line, uh, who's... Uh, was deeply involved in uh, the development of uh, uh, Xtiva and Prolia. So any any thoughts, guys? I mean, in terms of, you know, 
osteonecrosis, the chances of getting it are certainly higher in, with these drugs, but, you know, compression fracture, fractured hip, that's a whole different ballgame compared to getting ONJ. ONJ is nothing compared to that. And most cases, though not all, are reasonably mild. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't let that stop you. Um, just make sure any dental work that you need done is taken care of. If you have, uh, you know, anything that has to be done, get it done. Anything that's iffy, get it done. Um, you know, what makes the most likelihood of getting ONJ, osteoporosis, uh, the jaw is any kind of dental treatment that is invasive extractions, uh, you know, gum therapy, any anything that's going to need to have remodeling of the bone and or it can have infiltration of bacteria into the bone. I had my uh, fourth crown replaced yesterday <laughs> and I have next Thursday the, the fifth one. And... Uh, once they've removed the crowns, removed the decay underneath, put the crowns back on. So by the end of September, end of end of, of August, I should have all the dental work up to date um, that I had postponed during the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, and then just you want to just make sure that you have really good oral hygiene so that you don't get future problems. Um, I think I sent you an email about you know. Fluoride, uh, you know, prescription got, fluoride treatment. And... I, got, uh, I, I got that prescription yesterday. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and just, you know, pristine oral hygiene. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's my immediate, immediate plan is to get, is to start that and um, I really don't have any decisions to make. I do know from talking to Dr. Morgan's that she will not oversee dermal um, uh, estrogen for me. So if I decide to do that as an ADT drug, I'll be on my own um, getting guidance from Richard Wassersager, who's been doing it, and from several of you guys have done it over the years. So that's what I'd be doing. Um, and I've, I've gone to a neural path to be able to obtain the, um, the um, TE2 and the, uh, the testosterone precipitate. So, so I'd, be, I'd be doing that if, uh, if it comes to that. Uh, Rick, any, any thoughts? Any, or has it been captured <clears throat> from your perspective? You're on. You're on mute, Rick. Um, Thanks. Just took myself uh, off mute. Oh, sorry, Rick Stanton. Go Rick's ahead. Stanton. Yeah, but but uh, Rick, you're more than happy. Rick Davis, you're more than happy to chime in. So here in yeah, I was just going to say a couple of things to Jeff, and I actually wrote this to him yesterday. Uh, one is that. Um, this part I didn't write to you, but if you do decide to do the patches, the estrogen patches, um, look into getting uh, radiation to your chest before you start. Um, yeah. I've I've talked about this for years with docs, including cardiologists. Most of them feel that there's there's little to no risk, given the amount of radiation. It usually is two or three shots. For some guys, it really works well, but not for everybody. Um, but it is the best solution if it works to avoiding gynecomastia. Um, the second thing I wanted to say, which um, I just don't have enough knowledge about, but I'm intrigued where cardio issues are involved, whether a monotherapy, um, ARSI, might be a good option. Um, 
so that in other words you still will have testosterone running around in your system um but you're blocking it at the receptor level you know in theory it should have just as much many side effects but I, it just doesn't seem to because we know enough guys who have been on monotherapy um apalutamide and darolutamide actually not enzalutamide um and on monotherapy abiraterone which is a little different which i don't think would work as well but i would look I would explore with Dr. Alicia whether that might do. And I also think that, um, as I mentioned to you, um, Vivek Narayan is a really good guy at Penn. And he works closely with um, Dr. V because Steve Saft, could rest his soul, use both of them. And I work with 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 Dr. Narayan and Dr. V to help Steve, and um, and Dr. Narayan has a particular interest. He's a GU med -onc, med -onc, but he has a particular interest in cardio health. He's he, we actually um, are scheduled to to do a research project, and can schedule to do a research project with him at some point when they get their act together. So I think that a, a consult with Dr. Narayan um, would be very, very helpful in terms of monotherapy HT. That's it. I, I should just I should just say this. Um, I have gynecomastia in my left breast. Uh, it was this. So Dr. Morgan's um, had me get a mammogram, which I which turned out to be um, the gynecomastia, but not breast cancer. And then I contacted Dr. Vapawala about um, preemptive um, radiation. And she said, yeah, come on down. Um, we do it all the time. And I said, okay. Um, I'm, so I'm kind of going to wait to till after the PET, PET scan to see if I'm going down there just for the preemptive um, radiation for gyno climastia or if I'm going down there for something else. Yeah, so, but thanks, Rick. I appreciate it. Thanks, Rick. Uh, yeah, Rick's I'm Rick's just, I was just going to say, if you're going down there, set up a time to see Dr. Narayan as well. Yeah, I, I'll make it a point to write him a letter and ask and tell him where I am and ask him if I can consult with him. I find that, you know, these docs don't get letters. They get emails, they get Zoom calls, they get all kinds of stuff. When they get a letter, they actually read it. It's it's kind of like, no, they go, what the hell is this thing on my desk? <laughs> they, they, they read it, you know, and then they, they and you they kind of go, who's the guy that's actually types a letter? And uh, it, it's, it's worked for me with both my cardiologist. Yeah, that, and Jeff, you can tell him we sent you. You can tell him we recommended so, you because so we have I a nice did, relationship with him. Dairy and stuff that all means. Their stuff is, their peanut butter is every bit of Okay. Um, thank you, Rick. Uh, Rick Stanton, did you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I'd, I'd ask Robert, actually. Is there any reason why not XG, do you use Exgiva? Like, I don't know the complications, but... Yeah, I mean, are you, I, you're asking me? Yes, and um, I'm, I'm taking Exgiva now. Yeah, I'm uh, on Exgiva as well. I mean, Exgiva, um, you know... They, they all have similar risks as far as uh, osteonecrosis. Um, the only difference is you got to be careful once you stop Exgiva that you have, there can be a rebound effect. And, um, but, you know, I've had no side effects. I don't know about you. Um, Zero. Yeah. So, you know, I, I know some people get it monthly, but they seem to be going more quarterly. So that should decrease the risk of uh, ONJ. But, you know, any of these drugs will give you, you know, I think they, I think it's like two or 3% chance. And again, 80% of the people who get it are after having um, some kind of trauma, even if it's controlled trauma to the jaws. So maybe it would help Jeff? Oh, I, I would think. 
Yeah, I mean, it certainly, so, you know, I mean, if you go on the estrogens, that may help keep the osteoporosis from getting worse, but it's not going to improve it, I wouldn't think. Um, yeah, so exjiva or any of the um, bisphosphonates can help rebuild some of the bone. And again, the chances of osteonecrosis are pretty low. Okay. Great. Thank you, guys. Uh, Dave, can I, I, can I add some personal experience on osteoporosis and bone strengtheners that may be helpful? So, um, when I was diagnosed in 2007 and being placed on long term hormone therapy, um, my doctor ordered a DEXA scan, which is standard of care, although a lot of doctors don't do it. And it turned out I was osteoporotic in my spine, which was pretty weird to me because I was running about 3,000 miles a year at that point. And um, I, I got, because there wasn't any clear metastasis, in my case, it was micrometastasis, I got three infusions of Zometa over three over two years, one at the beginning, one in the middle, and one at the end of the two years. And I also changed my exercise habits and, and specifically work to um, put st stress on my spine in my exercise. And at the end of the three years, my um, bone density in my spine had gone from minus 2.5 to um, 0 0.9. It's still, now it's gone back again. So now I'm osteopenic again, but... Um, it can be done. Great. That's a great success story. That's good. Uh, David. Yeah, Jeff, some uh, personal anecdotes. Um, when I was first diagnosed, I uh, uh, was given a DEXA scan early on and discovered that I was osteopenic. So um, I was given an infusion of Zomita. And I had a reaction to that uh, that afternoon and night. I had a, uh, a fever. It topped out at 100 Fahrenheit. So just below the threshold where they had told me I needed to go to the ER. Um, and it only lasted about 12 hours, never came back. Uh, but that was enough of a reaction that six months later, instead of the next infusion of Zomita, they switched me to a different medication, which was Prolia, which is denosumab. Um, the prolia didn't give me any reactions at all. Um, it may have slowed the um, loss of bone density, but it did not stop it. So for the next cycle, they changed me to Exjiva, which is the same stuff, only a stronger dose. And that seems to have been more effective for me. And again, no side effects. So I don't know why the doctor preferred to start with Zomita, uh, whether that's just standard practice, but uh, apparently the reaction I had was pretty unusual. If I hadn't had that reaction, they probably would have continued with it. But um, uh, it's worked out well for me um, ever since in, in the past few years. That I'm still on Exjiva uh, every quarter. Okay. Thank you. Great. Uh, Russ. Russ, I'm not sure if you are... Yep. Uh, yes, I am. I'm trying to mess with my headphones. They're not working. Um, my wife is working in the room, so that's why I did it. Um, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about that. I did transdermal estrogen therapy, and never I did it by myself. Uh, my MO was uh, monitoring me, but um, I was doing it 100% myself, and it's really not very hard to do. Uh, 0.3 to 0.4 milligrams a day estrogen chimera patches worked very well for me took my testosterone to zero in about five weeks uh, there was a delay uh, some guys it takes three weeks five weeks I was getting a little bit nervous and thinking about going to Lupron uh, my bone density I had a I had a DEXA scan done uh, back in I guess it's about 11 years ago now and I had some intermediate ones done I knew that I had osteopenia uh, I had one done before my prostate cancer or right after the diagnosis, I guess it's right after the diagnosis. And then I had one done about a year and a half later. 
and the estrogen therapy is only four and a half months. So I can't be definitive about it, but it, it appeared that it appeared that something somehow my bone density stopped decreasing as much. Since I went on bat by four estrogen therapy, my bone density has increased by four point seven by four point zero to five point two percent, depending on what scans I look at, what measurements I look at. Uh, I've had uh, three DEXA scans. Uh, my bone mass also increased over four percent. The combination, uh, the, the technician who's running the DEXA scan, one of the, the second one uh, said, gee whiz, what did you do? I haven't seen anything like this. Um, I had uh, some thoughts about uh, the uh, RP or ARB RC uh, monotherapy. Uh, that has actually been studied. So it's not all only anecdotal. It is actually, I have some studies and I was going to mention that. That is a very good option. Uh, we, we see improved bone density results, uh, not, not improvements over your bone density, what it is, not an increase, but a reduced rate of decay. We all lose bone as, as we get older. Uh, those are those are my thoughts. So I would investigate the testosterone or the, the transdermal estrogen therapy, sorry. That is the only um, thing that I know of that is going to increase your bone density. And it can, and studies have shown it does increase across, uh, for, for other guys too. It's not just me. Uh, there's uh, anabolic steroids, nandrolone. It's an FDA approved steroid. Oxandrolone is another one. Uh, nandrolone has been shown to increase bone density. So that's another possibility to look into. And it's not very androgenic. So I see you having at least three possibilities here to look okay. into. Uh, an RP monotherapy, mm -hmm. a transdermal estrogen therapy, and nandrolone. In addition to, I would jump on board uh, with Exiva or something to to boost up my bone right now, address it immediately. Okay. And okay. the transdermal estrogen therapy, I know that some people say it's it's hasn't been shown to be it, it has been shown to be non inferior to Lupron. And if you look at the patch trial results, you will see it's I believe it's superior, so it's not statistically superior. It does, didn't reach significance, but it holds testosterone on lower. It holds it down better for more men, and you have the uh, bone loss, of course, is decreased, or uh, bone loss is decreased, and uh, cardiac events are, are decreased too, and that's something that a lot of doctors are not really aware of. I read that in the patch and the stampede trials that they – uh, that they that they did in UK uh, that uh, they were superior to uh, as far as cardiac events or or at least equal. So yeah, I, uh, they 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 will say they're equal because I don't believe it reached uh, the, when I looked at the past trial results they hadn't reached the statistical significance. So they have to say yeah we're equivalent. We're not we're uh, I think the word they use they use they say non inferior. But if you look at the results, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, well, that's not only non-inferior, you, you have less cardiac events and, and less bone loss. And so we're actually looking at, I think, superior results. Yeah, quality of life loss. Yeah. Or the trend is statistical, the trend to superior results. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, one thing, if you get the, if you start the uh, estromal estrogen therapy, if you're looking at, at you'll be, you'd be doing it with patches, uh, make sure you get one without progestin. Um, uh, progesterone, um, I think the uh, the Climera Pro, they mix in progesterone with, with, along with estrogen. You just want a straight estrogen patch. And you can get a, a, a Climera patch will have that. The Climera Pro has the other hormones in there too. And you don't want that. Oh. Okay. When I get there, Russ, I'll be on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Uh, Brad. Jeff, I think it would be useful for you to share with the group here the conversation you had with Alan Morris about um, Gleason score as a measure of the aggressiveness of your cancer and then what constitutes recurrence and then what, how do you measure doubling time? You, you alluded to it, but I thought, I thought I, I learned a lot just from that conversation. It was really interesting in your case because the aggressiveness of the cancer influences the aggressiveness of your treatment. And just as Bob Germankin was saying that, you know, maybe there's not that bad of side effects, you kind of need to know how aggressive you should be. And you're going to gear that a little bit on a, a prediction about the aggressiveness of your cancer. And he was, he was much more nuanced in that, an argumentation. 
Yeah. He was very helpful to me um, because I, when we had emails back and forth, he said, how did you, how did you get a, a PSA that hits you right on 0.21? And it was just luck. It's just the timing that I took it. And that was my first pro, um, biochemical recurrence. So that when it popped back up to 0.21 again, I thought I had reached biochemical recurrence a second time. And Alan pointed out to me that no, that number is, is not a, a fixed number because you have to do doubling time calculations. So basically I had my, the way I understood it, I had my radiation at UPenn, it took my um, PSA down to 0.14 um, following um, the end of the treatment. What was interesting was, and, and this is kind of anecdotal, um, because of the pain in my back, which turned out to be from the osteoporosis, I kept asking Dr. Bapawala every week when I met with her, um, was this normal to have pain? And she said, no, you'll have inflammation pain if you've got METs because that's normal, but the pain you've got doesn't seem to be normal. So that's why they were hunting with the, um, the MRI. But then when I was leaving, she said, don't get a uh, PSA for uh, six months because she said, you're gonna have a spike in PSA and we encourage our people when they've had radiation therapy, not to even look at um, PSA for six months or even longer. So I, and I assume that she and Dr. Morgans were talking because you know one referred me to the other, but they weren't. Um, because when I got back to Massachusetts, there was a PSA order um, in my, at my local affiliated hospital to MGB. So I got a PSA and it was higher. Um, and I just assumed the two, the two professionals were talking, it turns out they weren't. And uh, so I watched my PSA go high, then down, and then climb up to 0.21. And Alan Morris explained to me, he said, that's an arbitrary number. You haven't he says, he looked at my PSA chart that I showed you guys, and he said, I think your, your native PSA since your biochemical recurrence is 0.14. You've had it now steady there for six months, and now it's up to 0.12. So it's risen, you know, 50%, but it has not risen up to another biochemical recurrence. You have not reached that yet which was a very nice thing to hear. He said, really, if you look at it and do the you know, rough arithmetic, you won't reach biochemical recurrence until it's um, roughly 0.28 or greater. So, which it, um, could be, you know, um, in October, I'll be a year from um, that radiation. And he explained to me that your, um, your radiation therapy is still killing um, your prostate cancer cells where in the targeted area, which no one had explained that to me. Nobody, not Vapawala, not, not Morgans. Maybe they just assumed that I knew it, but I didn't. So I came away from that discussion with Alan Morris feeling encouraged that um, my PSA may just stay at a certain level um, and may not go rapidly up right now. It might go up tomorrow, but right at this point in time, it doesn't seem to be. So, so let me just summarize this, where I think whether this leaves us is that you thought you had a recurrence. And if you have a recurrence, then you need to go get on some prostate cancer drugs like androgen deprivation therapy. But he challenges to that very premise and says, I'm not sure if you've had a recurrence yet. You could still be cruising along sideways and you don't need to get any prostate cancer treatment at this moment. And so worry about your other comorbidities, worry about your bones or worry about your heart. And you're saying you maybe don't need to worry your heart. So this is pretty important in guiding your next steps, if I'm, if I'm understanding correctly. Yes, and I had the same guidance from one of my friends Ives, who has been overseeing his prostate cancer treatment, and 
she felt the same way. She said, you know, I just relax. You, you haven't recurred yet. And uh, of course, I don't listen to anybody and I just keep reading, but I keep looking and uh, wondering where I am. So uh, we'll, you know, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what happens, you know, with the next PSA and then whether or not it's probably Alan's final email to me last night at 11 o'clock or something. I mean, he's been, he's been terrific. He said, get your PSA, um, PSMA pet if you can, because that if you absolutely are, I want to be on top of it to see if there's anything there. Um, and Dr. Morgan said that at least at Dana-Farber, they um, will get some pushback from Medicare under a year but over a year, um, they don't get any pushback um, for getting PSMA pets. So I'll probably get it sometime in the fall. Um, if, I, if I, the... I feel like I should echo Rick Davis's comment. I'm, I'm getting PSMA scans quarterly. Medicare is covering them. Um, so huh. I think Rick really would hit the nail on the head there. Uh, and then the second thing is, uh, at least when I PSMA scans first started, I, I it's only a few years old, right? Uh, yeah. end of De December 2021. Yeah, I was told at UCLA that uh, if you uh, have a PSA under 0.6, uh, there's a pretty good chance that they're not going to detect anything. So uh, just a couple of things that uh, I, I think is true. What was interesting when I went out to, to the Veterans Administration in LA in the summer of 21 for that trial, Dr. Um, Barani was his name. He, and he said, I've seen men with METs, with, PS, um, with PSAs, of well under the 0. 0.4 because I'd heard that 0. 0.4 number too. You know, don't waste your time. So I and I said that to him. I said, um, in fact, Dr. Rossi said, don't waste your time. But of course, like I said before, I don't listen to anybody. So I asked Dr. Moran, and he said, I've seen our vets here with with Mets and um, with their PSA reading under 0. 0.4. So if you want to come out. And it's just the cost of if, you know, I had no cost in that thing. So it was the cost of an airline ticket in a hotel room. So that's what I did. And, uh, and he was right. I mean, I didn't have anything except the dye in my urethra, but uh, at least I had a baseline. So when Dr. Morgan's ordered it, when I did reach 0.21, she had something to compare it to. So I've had two now, but it'll be interesting to see. Um, I don't know, maybe Medicare pushes back or maybe the, medical oncologists try to control guys like me that want a, a PET scan every week, you know, so we'll see. Great. Uh, excuse me, uh, Russ, get your hand up. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I'd agree with getting a PSMA PET scan. Uh, remember that PSA is not cancer. Um, my MO, I kind of disagree with doing nothing uh, based on your Gleason score. Uh, my MO is very cautious and very, uh, very conservative. About, she um, likes the quality of life. She tells me to do anabolic steroids, for example, testosterone, keep doing it because you feel good, Russ. It's, <laughs> it's not hurting. It's what helping. But uh, my point is uh, in 2019, or what I would say in 2019, my PSA was undetectable. I'm also a Gleason 9. Uh, my my MO, who's very cautious about adding any kind of drugs to my system at all, uh, advised me to take Zytega and do ADT. So I don't, and, I, and Mayo also, the doctors there wanted me to do Lupron conventional ADT. I eventually did transdermal estrogen therapy, but uh, I, I don't I don't know if now is the time to not do anything. Mm -hmm. So well, I, don't, I, I don't. I I I think you could re possibly regret a decision not to do anything and let the cancer grow someday. Right now, you can. I think you can easily. I think we can easily control it. If but it, and it's not going to be onerous at this point in time. But if we let it grow and and then it could be quite a big undertaking. Okay. 
So I'd consider I'd consider that I consider listening, talking to some MOs, getting their opinions, getting their advice, and not necessarily always looking listening to me or just uh, uh, people who have not been uh, are not your doctors. Uh, yeah. And get a PSMA make that scan if you possibly can. Now that's what that's the goal I'm I'm going on it. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see. And also, uh, oh, I wanted to mention um, with your PSA about twenty. Um, if memory serves me correctly, clinical trials show about 25 to 30 percent of guys with your PSA have METs that show up on PSMA PET scans. Um, is you get to a, PS, a PSA level about one, uh, I think it's like 95 percent of guys have met something like that. It's pretty high. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Rick, go ahead. Um, yeah. I, there's a couple of guys on this on this session will testify we spoke about two of these issues yesterday in the ANCAN meeting I'm going to post the uh the link it hasn't oh yeah it has been um here's the link I'll put it in there right now now what I what I wanted to comment on was this PSA uh level when you do PSMA scans um the the literature the vision trial i think it was from the vision trial um quantified this and essentially there's a there's less than a 40 percent chance of seeing anything on the scan if your psa is less than 0.2 it doesn't mean you won't see it but your chances are reduced if your psa is above 0.6 um I think it's 0.65 actually it's around an 80 percent chance that you'll see something so really what you're doing is you're rolling the dice the thing to note and a lot of people don't get this is that this really is designed for people who don't see any metastasis like say Jeff and they're trying to figure out where their metastasis is. If you know you have metastasis and you want to see how it's changed, you could have you could be on ADT and have a, 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 a PSA of zero because the metastasis expresses PSMA. In fact, the more advanced the metastasis is, the more PSMA it it shows. And so you can be sitting there, you can do a PSMA scan with zero, and it's going to show where the Mets are. I mean, we had a guy yesterday talking about the fact that they just saw a lesion on his bladder wall, even though he's on PSA, on uh, ADT, and his PSA is insignificant. And we said to him, you've got a couple of options. You can do... Um, you can do a cystoscopy and you can get a, a, a biopsy, um, but you, you could also do a PSMA scan first. And if it shows up positive, you don't need the biopsy. If it doesn't show up positive, then do the biopsy. And then somebody said, well, you know, I just go get a biopsy. Fine. But, you know, in the, in the interest of doing no, no harm, uh, the least intrusive, the PSMA scan would sh would show it if if it was expressing PSMA. Mm -hmm. So you 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 have to bear that you have to bear that in mind when you're thinking about the PSA levels. Thanks, Rick. Uh, we've got just a, a few more minutes, um, Jeff. One of the things we haven't talked about uh, are any genomics that you have. And given that your your PSA is low, you may not have had any liquid biopsies. Um, but just curious if you're if anyone's looked at your genomic profile and and <clears throat> indicated that you have markers that would indicate you have um, uh, aggressive cancer. So now, actually, actually, I did have it done. Um, Doctor Morgan's ordered it, and I've got the I've got the the results. And it came back with, I think they they looked at 20, 26 or 28 markers, and none of them showed that I had any anything um, pointing towards prostate cancer. I, I asked Dr. Morgans about getting liquid biopsies, and she said, because she says, because your genetic profile showed none, um, 
in your DNA, you probably won't show any in a liquid biopsy either at this time. Um, but the, she said, well, we can do it next time if you want to. She's, but I doubt you'll show anything because uh, she's, we don't know if it's doubtful there's anything circulating right now that we can measure. Yeah. So yeah. that's how it's challenge right now with your, with your PSA being uh, so low. Okay. Yeah. All right, great. So um, I just want to be mindful of the time. Um, are there any other last thoughts for Jeff as he moves on to making his decisions? Yeah, I have a thought. Go ahead. I, I would get. I, I would. I would say, hey, it's doubtful. I have genetic mutations. That's all well and good. Thank you very much. Can you authorize the test? It's a blood test. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my MO start, my PSA was undetectable. And that's when I had my first blood test, genetic blood test. And my MO wanted me to have it. It's, I don't think it's universal across the board, just a, a, a guarantee where you don't have any mutations because your PSA is low. Your PSA is 0.21. Mine was less than 0 0.01 when we started okay. looking at it. And then also, if you do a garden they 360, they, 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 did, the other ones. They, they did find, um, well, they did not find any mutations. They did not find okay. any mutations. However, uh, one thing I was going to mention is uh, that's not the only information you get. You might get uh, you you get hit some analog measurements. Uh, for for example, for me, I, I had uh, uh, CTCs. Uh, they're they're looking at CTCs. So they get it and they they calculate a tumor mutational burden. Uh, you get information on that, and you can determine my tumor mutational burden has gone down since I started BAT. So it's nice that I had the PSA the P the sorry the liquid blood test done the genetic test done uh, a couple of years ago a few years ago because now I can see yeah boy this bat therapy is I had a baseline otherwise I wouldn't know well my CTCs are so low now that there's nothing to measure they can't they can't even calculate tumor mutational burden but I wouldn't know that that it hadn't existed that what three years ago but now I know that because I have a baseline I know that and yeah we've made some I've made some important progress okay that so makes that's sense. That's the thought. It's just it's just a blood test. You know, they take it with, uh, they they take it with if you're doing C if you're doing C CBC CMP PSA what testosterone whatever. It's just a blood test. Take it at the same okay. time. Yeah, they've got me scheduled for. Oh, I I failed to mention that I did see the endocrinologist, and uh, we went through all of the supplements I was taking or what have you, and he. Um, ordered a bunch of blood tests, um, you know, magnesium, calcium, all that. I have to take those. I can probably get in touch with Dr. Morgan and ask her to add that liquid biopsy. Um, and now because, because I haven't gone and done those blood tests, but the orders are in. It's just up the street. I can go do it. So I'll, I'll ask her to add that. Makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so, Brad, I think we're at the top of the hour. 